everyone. This is Shirley. I am one of the 800 certified tax planner in the U.S. I'm also fully licensed CPA in both Canada and United States. My firm, Freedom Folio, specializes in working with real estate professionals. And so far, we save our clients $2 million in IRS taxes and counting. So today, I want to talk about something that's not tax related. Um, it's more about my personal story as a Canadian who is starting a business in the United States. Um, for those of you who've worked with me, you know that I am licensed to practice in both Canada and U.S. And then the reason for that is because I am a Canadian conducting and operating a business in the United States. And I didn't really start that way. Um, 10 years ago, when I first moved here, um, you know, I was working in a family office for someone else. Um, but then, you know, the way that uh, things were done in that firm, because it's an 80 year old traditional CPA firm, uh, they have very prestigious clients, but then it was, everything was just done in a very old fashioned way. So it didn't really align with, you know, how I envisioned uh, accounting services should be delivered to client. And luckily I found an immigration lawyer who told me about E2 visa. So that's what got me started um, on this entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so about five years ago, I applied for my E2 with the help of this lawyer. Um, and that process, I do want to briefly explain to, you know, other fellow Canadians who are also thinking about starting a business in Canada. Uh, you know, if you don't have an E2, um, you most likely will not be able to, you know, set up a business and physically live here to operate that business. Um, to, to get an E2 visa, you need to, you know, um, of course, uh, you know, have fundings yourself. But then we're not talking about a lot of money. But I guess it depends on what kind of industry you're in because I was starting a uh, accounting firm. So the typical capital outlay for accounting practice is not that big. Um, of course, you have to show the embassy, uh, the U.S. embassy, that you've done your market research. So back then, you know, I think I invested about $50,000 of my own money into my new practice. And I also have to write a, a, a business plan showing them that number one, I have the capability and expertise to start this business. So you gotta you know, prove to people that you are gonna be successful. And then typically they're looking for someone who have experience in relevant field, right? So it can't be like, you know, I am an engineer, but I'm starting a calling firm. Um, and then, you know, that's just not gonna be very feasible because that's not even related. And then the second thing is, you know, they wanna see that you do have plan to like hire people um, in the United States. So you're gonna be self-sufficient and also you're gonna make enough money to make hires. Um, and then I think the uh, last thing they're looking for is that intent intention. So you did not intend to set up this business for to, to immigrant here, because again, the E2 does not have an immigration intent. So you have to commit in writing that, you know, I am not doing the E2 because I want to get my green card. So if green card is your ultimate goal, I don't think E2 is the shortest path to get there. Um, but, you know, if for me, like, you know, I was first on a TN temporary work visa, and then I switched over to an H1B, but you know, H1B is like a lottery. So I think I tried two years and I didn't even get H1B. And then that, and then again, at the time I was thinking about, you know, starting my own business anyways, that's always been a dream. Um, so that's why I got on E2. I did not really um, care so much about the green card at the time. I just wanted to, you know, to do something that I've always wanted to do. Um, and then again, you know, the game plan was like my husband, cause he's an engineer. So he, was lucky enough to get his H-1B on the second attempt. Um, so one of us was on H-1B already anyways. So eventually one of us is gonna get the green card. And then uh, the game plan was, you know, my E-2 is gonna change to um, green card once my spouse, you know, successfully received his green card. So my status will update accordingly. Now, of course, in terms of timeline, I severely underestimated how long it was gonna take for my husband to get his green card because he received his uh, H-1B status and right away his company started preparing to submit his green card application. The whole thing took almost 10 years because a lot of things has happened in between. Uh, of course, a lot of times the lawyer messed it up. Um, uh, and then, so I think that also delayed uh, his application almost by three years uh, and none of that was really planned. <laughs> so uh, I did not expect to wait that long for a green card. And then it just happens that, you know, my E-2 is only good for five years. Um, so yeah, so uh, I digress. So back to how I got that E2. Um, for my lawyer, so she prepared this package for me. It was like a pretty thick binder that she put together and it includes like everything that I talked about, you know, like, you know, where you got the initial money to start your business. Um, and then the 50 grand that I invested, I have to uh, show them how I invested the money. Like, what did I buy? You know, um, and then I have to put together like a financial statement, including like a five year forecast um, as to where I think the business is going to be in five years. Um, so it was like a 30 page long plan that I work 
uh, together with my lawyer on. Um, and um, yeah, I actually hired somebody to do this for me at first and paid a couple grand and it was not very well written. So I had to go in and rewrite everything. And then after um, I submitted all the documentation, and again, it was like, as you can see, it's a lot of uh, paperwork, um, but then I had my lawyer, you know, put together the whole thing and then she uh, fill out the application for me and the schedule the interview. And I just had to show up uh, at the embassy for my interview. But that was a very interesting experience because, you know, um, I went into the embassy at the scheduled time and I was just sitting, um, there and waiting for my turn. There was another lady who was also starting an accounting firm and she had her whole family with her. She brought two kids and her husband. Uh, they were all there. They went to see the interviewer officer with her. And I remember vividly that, you know, she was rejected because she was crying and then she was begging for the officer to reconsider. Uh, but I think in the end, they just turned her away um, and told her to go home and wait for some updates. Uh, so she basically didn't walk out of the embassy uh, with the A2 visa in hand. So I think she she just had a meltdown. And that really scared me a little bit because I went uh, right after her. And I was also starting a CPA practice. Uh, so I wasn't sure if I was going to get it. Uh, but, you know, and at the time, I didn't even have that many clients. Um, you know, I would just start, remember, I was just starting out and then, you know, I just had the whole business set up. I was not even legally allowed to operate anyways. Uh, so I wasn't even sure if I was able to make a compelling enough case. Uh, but then I did have like client contract in hand, you know, a deposit that they already made. Um, and then luckily, you know, the officer just asked me uh, very few questions and then he approved me on the spot. Uh, so I walked down the line and then got my E2 visa stamp on my passport and went out of the embassy. Uh, and then my lawyer called me right away because she was also worried that I was not going to make it because, again, I didn't really invest that much money. It was only 50 grand. Um, but, you know, she was also surprised to find out that I got approved. Um, so then I came back into the U.S. as an E2 investor and I was able to, you know, operate the business legally as a Canadian. Uh, and I do have, you know, the LLC set up. Um, I have a payroll set up, everything. Uh, so, but every two years I have to renew my I-94 because uh, the E-2 is valid for Canadian for five years, uh, but the I-94 is only good for two years. So every two years I have to leave uh, U.S. and come back to Canada uh, and get my I-94 renewed. Um, I do remember doing this at least two times. And one time I did it at the airport, it did not go very well at all. Um, like I went in with like all my documents, right? I went in with like my tax return. And then my business financial um, and then like some client checks and everything. Um, but the officer at the airport was just not experienced with E2 at all. I'm pretty sure he's never even heard of E2 before. Um, and then so he, I remember he called his supervisor and then the supervisor was not there. So they told him to turn me away. And then he told me he was going to put me on the fly back to Canada the next morning. And I was telling him, you know, uh, my I-94 is not expired yet. You ca technically cannot kick me out because I'm still legally allowed to stay and work here. Uh, so luckily he did not put me on the next morning flight because I don't know what I would do. Um, but I did have much better experience renewing my E2 at the uh, border traveling by land. Um, so I, a couple of times I drove to uh, Vermont and then I just uh, went over to Quebec border because I live in Boston. Uh, Quebec is fairly close. It's only like five hour drive from where I was. So I could come back the same day. I literally just went out of the border, come back in. And then, you know, they asked me for very standard questions. They didn't even see anything technically. And then they just stamped my passport again with an updated I-94. And I was good to go for another two years. Um, so fast forward five years from uh, when I first got my E2. Of course, my visa completely expired. Um, like last year, October, but my I-94 is good until this year, January. Um, and I think the lawyer just dropped the ball. Uh, nobody told me that, you know, I needed to come back or I needed to submit the application six months prior to my E2 completely expired because your visa is expired. That means you have to get a new visa. OK, so it's not the same as renewing your I-94. These are two completely different things. Uh, so I don't even think the lawyer, like at least my lawyers didn't really understand that. Um, so I ended up uh, just doing very poor planning for my E2. Um, so what I end up the situation I'm ending up with right now is, uh, you know, I'm back in Canada by myself uh, because I, I can't really legally stay and operate a business in U.S. anymore, even though I am queuing up to get my green card, maybe as soon as I go back. Um, but if I don't renew my E2, then I technically, can, technically cannot continue to operate my firm. Um, so I end up leaving the U.S. on the day that my I-94 expired um, and I had to book the Airbnb. I had to fill out all those applications that the lawyer asked me to do um, and then, you know, doing all that documentation stuff. Um, not as, not as intense as the first time when I got the A2, but I still had to get together, you know, like the wage report, the quarterly payroll report, uh, my company financial, updated financial for the full year, client contract, marketing materials that we have, um, 
books I wrote. So I, I had to just put together all everything for the lawyer. And then the lawyer put together the application package for renewal and then submit it via email. Um, so yeah, so that was a completely different experience compared to first time when I got the E2. And then after I come back, a week after I come back, the embassy informed me that they waived my interview. So I don't have to go in for my E2 renewal interview, which is good news. But then I had to, you know, mail in my passport. So now I really can't go anywhere. Um, so I basically made this video because I really feel like there was a huge lack of transparency in this whole E2 application process, you know. They only tell you what E2 is good for, but then they don't really tell you the nuances. Um, I wish like my lawyer told me that I needed to be mentally preparing for, you know, staying in Canada all by myself for a month. Um, actually, I found out th about this maybe a couple of days before I had to leave the country. So there was a lot of poor planning and I have kids. Um, so I wish that someone told me this before. So if you are a Canadian and you are thinking about, you know, starting a business in the US, um, I think definitely E2 is a very viable option. But again, just be aware that E2 is not, uh, you know, it does not, it does not have immigration intent. So if you do want to get your green card or, you know, up your life to US and then eventually live in the, U in the US permanently, like I do, um, you know, it's best if you uh, pursue some other option. So you do have the option to maybe sponsor yourself um, after you've been in the US for five years on the E2 um, as like, you know, a uh, what do they call it? Like extraordinary talent because you've been operating a successful business for five years in the in the US. They call it national waiver. So you do have the option to uh, get your green card that way. Um, but um, yeah, but E2, if, if you just want to do E2 and then uh, and then get started in US as a business owner, I think that's probably like the fastest way that you can, you know, enter the US market as a Canadian business owner. Um, and um, yeah, and that is if you are planning to come into the U.S. and operate a business. If you have, you know, what I call like a virtual business, um, like an online business, it probably doesn't really matter where your location is. Um, but yeah, maybe you want to move to U.S. for tax reasons because, you know, in the U.S., uh, the tax is a lot more favorable compared to Canada. Um, but then again, you know, each country has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, it was just my personal choice to, uh, you know, move to US. And then I just want to take this opportunity and share my E2 experience with everybody. So if you are planning to come into US and do some business uh, as a Canadian, feel free to reach out to me on this channel, uh, because I really, really do want to help out another fellow Canadian. And hopefully you don't have to go through the same thing as I did, uh, because the whole thing can get very stressful and very frustrating sometimes. Um, so yeah, I hope this video has been helpful. And then I look forward to connecting with some other Canadian business owners uh, through this channel. Thank you.